to God be the glory. One of my favorite songs that we sing in the church says, There is a God, He is alive, in Him we live and we survive. Is God really alive today? Does He provide for us? Does He interact with us? When I pray, does He really hear me? Or has God just set the world in motion and, and He just watches from afar? That's what we're going to talk about today. That is the providence of God. And so I want to begin at the, at the very start here and ask the question, what is the providence of God? How does God work in the lives of mankind today? Friends, to begin with, I want to suggest to you that there are a lot of different views in the world with regard to how God interacts with us today. Of course, first there is the atheist view. The atheist would say God is not working at all because they would say God does not exist. They would say we're alone in the universe. Secondly, we might suggest what we would call the, the Calvinist view. The Calvinist view is that all of life is predestined to happen and that everything happens for a reason. God coordinated it. Nothing is left to chance, but rather every event happens because God wanted it to happen that way. Next, there is what I'm going to call the deist view. They believe that there is a God, but He doesn't interact with us at all. He sees all, but He does nothing. And then there is the charismatic view. The charismatic view is that God is working in the lives of man today. Frequently, they would say, through the use of miracles. And so, if a piano is going to fall on your head, then God will divinely, miraculously guide you to move out of the way. But of course, there's a problem with that view, and that is that charismatics sometimes have pianos fall on their heads. But friends, none of these views is consistent with what the Bible teaches about providence. None of these views properly represents the way that God works in our lives today. I want to suggest to you that God works in our lives today providentially. Now, what do I mean by that? What is providence? In truth, the word providence is hardly found in the Bible at all. In the old King James Version, it's found only one time. In other translations, the word is completely absent. But the fact that the word is unknown in the Bible doesn't mean that providence is not found in the Bible. In fact, the one time in the King James Bible where the word providence occurs is in Acts 24 and verse 2. But even there, it's not talking about God's providence. It's talking about a, a Roman official and the fact that he was the one doing the providing. But again, the absence of the word does not mean that God does not provide. Friends, God's providing is seen throughout the Bible. In fact, you can see the word provide in the word providence, providence. The prefix pro means before, and the vitance part of the word in English has to do with being able to see. In fact, we get our word video from the same root. Providence literally means to see before. God in heaven sees beforehand. In fact, if you look up the definition of the word provision, this is what it says. A measure taken beforehand to deal with a need or a contingency. Friends, that's all we're talking about, is that God, in His power and might, sees my needs in advance, and He operates in this natural world to take care of us. God works in our lives. He provides for us. He cares for us. He looks out for us. And we're calling that His providence. Now, the first point that I want to make, and this is very important as we discuss His providence, I want to discuss the difference in providence and miracles. You know, there have been times in the past that God provided for His people, but He did it by the means of miracles. When Jesus fed the 5,000 in Matthew chapter 14, He made provision for their physical means, but He did it in a miraculous way. And so what He did was He set aside the natural laws of the, the universe and miraculously the, the fish would just keep replicating. They were there. They did not run out. God provided that way. When God parted the Red Sea in Exodus 14, the, the sea parted. That doesn't naturally happen. 
but He provided for the Israelites. He protected them by the means of a miracle. On occasions such as this, God steps in and He abruptly interrupts natural law. But friends, even in Bible times, miracles were the exception rather than the rule. I think that sometimes we have mistakenly believed that from the beginning of the Bible until the close of the book of Revelation, that God's just constantly working miracles. And that because God is not working miracles today, that that means that God is not really involved in my life today. I want to ask you a question. When you ate supper last night and you enjoyed that good meal, where did that bread come from? Did God provide the bread for you and the water that you drink, the bottled water that you had? Did God provide that water for you? The answer is absolutely. Now, is there any difference in the source of the water that miraculously came out of the rock in Exodus 17 and the water that was on your table when you ate dinner last night? Friends, there's no difference at all. God provided it. And the fact that He did not provide it miraculously to you doesn't change the fact that God still provides. Did you know that there are only five times in the Bible when there are an abundance of miracles? Let's count them together. Number one is the creation. There was an abundance of miracles at the creation just because of the very nature of creation. Number two is at the exodus. At the exodus, you've got the plagues and the parting of the Red Sea, the giving of the Ten Commandments. But after you get beyond the promised land, how many miracles are there? I mean, you get beyond Jericho and you'll be troubled to find a, an abundance of miracles other than, you know, Joshua causing the sun to stand still. Does that mean that God was not working with the Israelites when they were capturing city after city and nation after nation? Of course He was working with them, but He was doing it in a natural way, not miraculously. The third time in the Bible when you read about a lot of miracles is in the work of Elijah and Elisha. There are seven miracles of Elijah, 14 miracles of Elisha, so you have 21 miracles there. Now, why is that? Why did God do that? The purpose was to confirm these prophets of God and to show that the message they were speaking came from God. God was authenticating the office of the prophet. And as a matter of fact, that is always the purpose of miracles, to confirm the message and to confirm the messenger. You remember in Egypt, it was told to Pharaoh, this message is from God. That was why the miracles were done. At Mount Sinai, there were miracles when the new law was given. This law is from God. The fourth time that there is an abundance of miracles is when Daniel gets over into Babylon. Now, why then? Because he's in a pagan land and God's messenger needed to be made known. And so you've got the interpreting of the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar. You've got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. You've got Daniel in the lion's den. Why? God is authenticating His messengers. That is, they're speaking for me, this message is for me, here are miracles to prove it. The fifth time in the Bible when you find a bunch of miracles is in the time of Jesus and the apostles. But friends, you get beyond those five times, you just don't find a lot of miracles where there's just one after another. But this is what I want you to get. That does not mean that God was not working. You see, Miracles were always the exception. That's why people were amazed at them. They weren't used to seeing them. Now, what's the point? Miracles have always been rare, but God has always worked in the lives of men. Sometimes people will say, well, you folks don't believe in miracles, and so you don't believe that God is working today. First, we do believe in miracles. We believe in every miracle that is listed in the Bible, every last one. But we also believe in 1 Corinthians 13 and Ephesians 4 and other passages that say that miracles have ceased today. Secondly, just because we don't believe in miracles taking place today does not mean that we don't believe that God is working in our lives today. Of course God is working in our lives today. Friends, throughout history, most of God's workings have not been through miracles. You know, oftentimes today when, when speaking, we make a distinction between miracles and providence. And what we mean by that is simply this. 
God is working in our lives today, providentially. What we mean is He's not interrupting natural laws by the use of miracles. And so, when a brother's in the hospital, we pray that God will help him. We don't expect that God, through a miracle, is, is going to fix this man's heart and just, boosh, you know, the man's heart's going to be instantly healed. What we mean is that God is going to work through the doctors and the nurses and through natural healing processes, He's going to restore this brother. Sometimes people will say, well, if you don't believe in miracles, then you don't believe that God is powerful today. Oh, I reject that. I want you to consider the power involved in a prayer for a brother who's in the hospital. How is God going to answer when I pray for that brother? Friends, perhaps years before, God seeing beforehand, remember the definition of providence, God seeing beforehand already knows this is going to happen. He's already arranging circumstances. And so a man goes to medical school and he moves to your city. Due to a schedule change, he ends up being your doctor on this particular day. And I don't know all the things that are involved in God's providence, but what I'm saying is this. The power involved in God answering that prayer providentially is amazing. God is working in the world today providentially, naturally, not miraculously. Now, here's a second point that is very important for us to consider as we think about providence. I want you to listen to this because this is deep. You can't recognize specific acts of providence unless God tells you. Now, with a miracle, it's obvious that God is the one providing. In fact, that's the point of a miracle, that it is from God. You can't deny it. Only God can do a miracle. But you know, there are other times in which God would work in a non-miraculous way. Let me give you some biblical examples of this. I want you to think about the story of Joseph. Joseph goes down to the land of Egypt. Think about all the things that transpired down there in the land of Egypt and how he ended up there. And you remember the coat of many colors and his brothers are jealous and they sell him into slavery and he ends up being in Pharaoh's, uh, Potiphar's house and then Pharaoh's house. And eventually he is in a position to provide food for his entire family, the Israelites, during the famine. When you get to the end of the story, this is what Joseph says to his brothers. In Genesis 45, 8, he says, God sent me before you to this place. Then in Genesis 50 and verse 20, Joseph said, You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. How do we know that all of this in the life of Joseph was the plan of God? Friends, we only know it because the Bible tells us so. The life of Joseph is a wonderful example of God working through the lives of men through providence. The vast majority of this were, were natural circumstances, not miraculous. But you know, sometimes in our individual lives, we may see something happening and we may be tempted to say, this is the providence of God. It may be, it may not be. You know, we just really don't have a way of knowing. And as Christians, as children of God, we need to be very careful about this. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift comes from God. There's not a single good thing that has ever come into your life that didn't come from God. But the danger we sometimes face is in looking at specific things and saying, God made this happen. Let me illustrate this. If you think about the story of Esther and Mordecai in the book of Esther, you think about all the things that happen in that story. You think about how in the beginning the king's wife Vashti respected modesty and she refused to come out and let the king's cronies look on her and so he ends up removing her as the queen. And then there's the time that Mordecai saves the life of King Ahasuerus, but the king doesn't reward him until later. And then you think about out of all of the people, when they pick a new queen, Esther, a Jewess, ends up being the queen, just as Haman decides he's going to kill the Jewish people, God's people. Now, think about all of these daily events in that story. And yet, when the day came that Esther is in a position to save the lives of the Jews, Listen to what her cousin Mordecai says to her. He says in Esther 4 and verse 14, he says, Esther, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? I want you to think about that for a minute. 
Mordecai does not say, Esther, God absolutely, positively put you in this place for such a time and such a purpose. Why didn't he say that? He didn't know it. He couldn't prove it. You never know that apart from direct revelation from God. Mordecai says, who knows, Esther? He says, maybe this is part of God's plan. Maybe this is God's workings. Friends, how exciting it is to think about events in your life and to say, who knows if God has put me in this place for such a time as this. Maybe you have the job that you do because of the providence of God. Maybe you being there is going to result in your coworker eventually becoming a Christian. Maybe not even now. Maybe it's going to be later. Maybe you're planting the seed that's later going to grow. You know, I believe with all of my heart that if a person is truly seeking the truth, that he will be able to find it. Why do I believe that? I believe that first because Matthew 7, 7 through 11, Jesus promised that if we seek, we will find. I believe that because Acts 17, 27 says that man is made in such a way as to seek the Lord and that God is not far from any of us. I believe that because Romans 1 and verse 20 says there is innate evidence of God in nature so that we are without excuse. And I believe that because 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 says that God wants all men to be saved. Now, you put all of those together and then you add Matthew 7, the promise to the true seeker is that he will find? What I conclude is this. God will, in a providential way, make sure that a true seeker has the ability and the opportunity to find the truth. Now, how's he going to work that out? Maybe it'll be through me. Maybe it'll be the house that I choose to move into. Maybe it will be the job where I've been hired. Maybe I have a desk next to this person. You know, there have been times in my life that I have been tempted to say, this is the providence of God. But the point that I'm making right now is, without direct revelation from God, I can't really know that. But friends, isn't life exciting when each day I can think God may be using me in this way? Here's another biblical example. Think about the Apostle Paul. In the book of Philemon, you read about a slave who has run away. His name is Onesimus. His master is Philemon. Onesimus runs away and he flees to Rome. Well, it just so happens the apostle Paul ends up in Rome and he happens to know Philemon. So Paul is in Rome. Onesimus is in Rome. Think about all the events that transpired to get Paul to be in Rome at the same time that Onesimus is there. And there are some individuals who would say, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Paul was there for two years in Caesarea because God wanted him to be there. And there's the shipwreck and there's all the things that transpired. And then all the circumstances under which Onesimus ran away. Some people would even say, God made Onesimus run away. And God brought Paul and Onesimus together and he became a Christian. There are some people who would even say, God made all of that happen. But when you read the Bible, do you know what the Bible actually says? When Paul writes to Philemon in verse 15 about Onesimus running away, this is what he says. Perhaps, think about that word. He says, perhaps Onesimus departed from you for this purpose. That is, he says, maybe. Friends, do you know how exciting that makes life? To look on every event, just ordinary daily events as perhaps I'm in this person's life for such a time as this. Perhaps this person's in my life for such a time as this. Life becomes unbelievably exciting. You know, maybe on my way home today, I will stop and have a conversation with somebody who's looking for the truth. Those of you who might be Bible class teachers, who knows if there's some young man in your Bible class who will become a, a great gospel preacher and who will save souls and change the world. How exciting life becomes when you consider that perhaps God is going to use me for this great, great purpose. Several years ago, there was a man in prison. He was on death row. A member of the church in another state sent him a Bible correspondence course. The man worked through it. He decided he wanted to become a Christian. He wanted to be baptized. 
but the chaplain, the warden, wouldn't let him do it because death row inmates were a risk. They, weren't, they were not allowed to leave death row. You know, it's too big a chance they might escape. And so this lady found a Church of Christ near the prison, and she called, and I answered the phone. She explained the situation. I called the prison, and I talked to the chaplain, and I said, I want to come and baptize this man. He refused. I persisted. I came up with different scenarios, how we could work this thing out. Finally, he agreed to a scenario. And so we brought in a big uh, rolling laundry bin, and we lined it with plastic. And we went outside in the winter, and we got a water hose, and they put us in a, a caged-in area, and we filled in this plastic bin with this frigid cold water. Eventually, they brought the man out. First time I got to see him. He's in shackles. He's got several guards. They pick him up, and they put him into this laundry bin filled with frigid cold water, and they allowed me to dunk him. I had a hard time getting the man back up in this little cart, and he's shackled on his hands and his feet. When they got him out, I said, Welcome, brother. He's shivering. They took him away. I never saw him again, and they executed him soon afterwards. Do you believe that providence was working in that man's life? You know, it sure looks like it to me. And in one sense, God was certainly providing. He was providing the gospel via his church, via a gospel preacher. But did God cause it to happen that way? Friends, that's another question. One year ago, I was involved in a four-wheeler accident that has left me as a paraplegic. I will more than likely spend the rest of my life in a wheelchair. But you know, that accident and my injury has opened some doors to me that I would likely never have had opened. After my accident, we had to alter my house, have it modified for my wheelchair, and during the construction, I was able to teach and to baptize four of the contractors who were working on my house. I've been invited to speak at a conference of uh, financial investors and to tell my story and to talk about the Bible. That would have never have happened. A video that I did about the accident has gone you know, semi-viral. Tens of thousands of people have watched it, people who otherwise maybe would have never heard the truth. And so do I believe that God caused the accident? I absolutely do not believe that. I do not believe God is going around crashing people on four-wheelers. But do I believe that God can use that accident providentially to reach people with the truth? Absolutely, I do believe that. Dear friend, as we conclude our discussion today, maybe you've been searching for the truth. You know, it may be the providence of God that brought you to watch this video today.